I know you don't need me to tell you that the markets have been in a euphoria over the last year. And the housing market is really no different. It rose 20% across the board in the US and even across the Western world with countries like the UK, France and New Zealand seeing similar crazy markets. And then there are the hotspots, places like Austin, Texas, which have made a 20% increase in value look like nothing special at all. Of course, when something like this happens, there will always be those who claim that this is nothing out of the ordinary, that the housing market is supposed to rise forever and never crash. But a price rise this drastic in what is basically the largest asset class in the world is not sustainable and it can't continue forever. Now trust me when I say there are plenty of issues at play here and there are plenty more reasons to be cautious when listening to the pundits explaining why all fears are unnecessary. But today we're going to look at what these underlying issues actually are, where these issues will emerge and where they will cause the largest drops in home prices when the crash starts. But really quickly, if you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe. If you like this content, make sure to like the video and leave a comment for the algorithm. This video was made in partnership with The Daily Upside, a free daily newsletter that offers business and investing insights, but more on that later. So right off the bat, I know that you're bored of hearing it, but trust me when I say it, I'm even more bored of telling you inflation is here to stay and it is a problem. At least when I make a video about it or talk about it today, no one can call me crazy anymore and say that I'm just a bear because the data is there, even the Fed have changed their mind. Those who were the bastion of inflation is transitory have ceded their position, the meek heavens, the feds of the world, and even they now admit that inflation is not just going to disappear and be replaced with deflation because when car prices go up, they have to come down afterwards because it doesn't work like that. No, the truth is out, and in fact, inflation is here to stay, at the very least for a couple of years, but probably a fair while longer than that. Now, obviously, that would be a big enough problem to worry about on its own, but it isn't the only one at play here. Next, we have the trouble with the bounce back effects after the lockdowns and the expected growth in the economy as a result of it. Go back six months and every economist and investor worth their salt were preaching about the huge growth and the low unemployment we were about to see and what it would mean for our asset values in the future when we got back to normal after the pandemic. Unfortunately, it hasn't played out that well in reality and people are starting to change their minds. Growth forecasts for pretty much every Western nation have been cut down over the last two months and unemployment figures have been decreasing but at far lower rates than we had been expecting. Nowhere has this been more prevalent than in the US, where job creation reports have been missing target after target for months now. Now, hands in the air, this was something I missed as well. I did not predict this would happen. I thought high consumer sentiment would carry us through a year of growth higher than we could ever imagined. But for reasons as of yet unknown, that hasn't been the case and we're still not sure why. Now, some people are claiming that this is all due to the emergence of the Delta variant, but to be perfectly honest, I just don't see it. Now, with inflation high and unemployment looking like it might stay high as well, stagflation is a term that is getting increasingly popular. Now, for those of you who don't know, it's actually really not that complex. It's basically just the idea that our economies as a whole will suffer from sustained high inflation combined with high unemployment that will cause our countries to stagnate. Now in nominal terms, so when inflation isn't taken into account, GDP and the markets will likely continue to rise throughout stagflation, but in real terms, when inflation is considered, the growth that we might see will be far lower than otherwise expected. We then have the potential for interest rate hikes or not even the potential anymore because it's all but guaranteed, we just don't know when they will actually happen. Now, if they just rise by 0.2 or 0.5%, then the effect won't be that huge. But if they rise up to the historical averages of three or 4%, homes all over the world will instantly become unaffordable. Now, once again, three or 4% interest rates aren't a distant possibility. Go back 20 years and they were the norm, they were the averages. It's just that in these days, we've gotten addicted to the 0% interest rates set by central banks trying to stimulate economies. Now, higher interest rates will obviously make borrowing to buy a house more expensive and more unaffordable. That is even more unaffordable than they already are because that's the final problem we're seeing. Most people in this day and age just can't afford to buy a house anymore, meaning there's no way for prices to keep rising like this 
as there literally aren't enough people to buy them, only corporations. Clearly, these problems are not going to combine and cancel each other out, they're going to make each other worse. Now, if you're like me, you're interested in financial news and investing, but you struggle to find up-to-date, unbiased and interesting news from the mainstream media, then you need to hear about this video's sponsor, The Daily Upside. The Daily Upside is a free daily newsletter written by a team of former investment bankers, scholars and journalists who now dedicate their time sourcing colourful insights on the largest marketing, moving stories of the day. It's clear, concise, witty enough to keep you entertained and it's emailed directly to you every morning. It's read by both retail investors and professional investors alike and can help you get an edge over the markets by keeping you informed. There's no headache inducing financial talking point jargon that the mainstream media uses and as someone who needs to stay up to date on financial news to put out videos just like this one, I can really recommend them. You might be surprised to hear that Wall Street banks like Wells Fargo have been struggling this past quarter with rising costs and falling demand for loans. This article covering the imminent decline of Wall Street profits is the perfect article to encapsulate the daily upside. It's clear and concise and squeezes everything you need to know into a two minute read. They are trusted to deliver accurate, reliable and entertaining daily updates by 150,000 readers and are absolutely free so there's no reason for you to not try them out. For those of you who might be interested by that, there's a link down below in the description. I highly recommend you check them out. So where are the problems worst and when the market does crash, which cities will be hit worst? Well, one way to try and work that out is to see which cities have seen inventory increase or decrease over the last year. Put very simply, when inventory increases, supply goes up, there are more sellers than buyers and prices are forced down. That's what happened following 2008 on a huge scale as people were foreclosed on or just had to move into smaller homes and really that's what led to the crash. Another way to see where the bubble might have come to an end is to look at which cities are seeing the most price cuts in listings. Basically where sellers are struggling to sell their homes and where prices are already falling as a result. Unsurprisingly, these two data points line up quite well as they are both leading indicators for areas which are at the peak of their bubble or even for where they're already starting to decline. Boise in Idaho has seen the amount of price cuts in its market rise a ridiculous 900% over the last year, meaning that a year ago the market was very strong but it's softened a hell of a lot and is on the verge of a crash. Austin, Texas, one of the big winners over the last year, especially with the influx of jobs and workers, has seen price cuts rise by 40% over the last year. Stockton, California has seen a 120% increase. Washington, D.C. has seen a 50% increase. Tucson, Arizona, a 30% increase. All of these increases in the number of sellers cutting their prices indicates that the housing bull market might just be over. And when looking at inventory change over the last year, it tells the same story. We're seeing more supply in cities like Boise, Washington DC, San Diego, Fresno and Stockton. Now this does seem to be a much stronger effect in the west of the US, in places like California especially, but that's no surprise really, because that's the area that saw the strongest boom over the last year. Now while I only mentioned a few select cities there, the trend across the entire US is far more broad. Active listings across the entire country are steadily declining and it's going to continue going that way, pushing prices down. Obviously the areas that have been hottest over this last year are likely to fall quicker and faster and harder than the other areas, places like California especially. But what do the experts have to say? The industry insiders, the people with all the data that we don't have? Well, thankfully for us, Glenn Kelman, the CEO of Redfin, is there to clear that up. A little bit of a slowdown, but, but nothing major. And, and what's causing that? Well, it's just a return to normalcy. So demand has slackened somewhat, but it's still strong. What's really new is that new listings are up about 10%. We haven't seen a real increase in inventory in a long time. It was hard to persuade sellers to put their homes on the market because they thought if we wait one more month, we're going to get more money. But now I think sellers have realized we're near the top of the market. They're more eager to get their homes listed and sold. And so it's easier to put deals together than it has been in a year. So, so we're near the top of the market, you think? I don't think you're going to see price appreciation of 20 or 25% for years. So prices may still remain strong. About a third of homes are selling in a week. Um, but they aren't going to be shooting through the roof the way they were in the spring or last fall. So that was Redfin CEO Glenn Kelman, who has been trying to make a name for himself on CNBC over the last year. He just loves to go on air and tell everyone where the market is going, but he's usually far more optimistic than that. For the longest time, he was pushing the idea that the market isn't overvalued, 
that people are willingly paying these sky-high prices and that there is no downside in sight. During this interview from the last month, however, he clearly seems a little more cautious. He said the market had peaked and then quickly backtracked and claimed that he hadn't said that, but maybe he meant growth had peaked, who knows. To me, it seems like he was just trying to make sure he wouldn't make an incorrect prediction. He doesn't want to damage any status he might have built up over the last year. If he says there is no crash in sight and then one appears seemingly out of nowhere to him at least, then he's lost all credibility. Now, that's no surprise. This is the exact same thing we see the Fed doing every month. They just slightly adjust their predictions every month and they gradually get further and further away from what they had originally claimed, but they are never outright wrong. Now, Redfin might just seem like a real estate company, but in reality, it's a data company and it's the largest data accumulator in the real estate market in pretty much the entire world. That's why, despite Glenn Kelman's smiles and shadows, it's actually quite important to listen to what he has to say to try and work out what he's seeing behind the scenes. From my point of view, though, it is all seeming to get clearer and clearer. One month ago, Kelman claimed that we are near the top of the market, but the crash still hasn't happened. Does this mean that we're not in a bubble or that the market isn't overvalued? Well, in short, no, it doesn't. The lack of a crash doesn't mean that we're further away from one than before. If the market was overvalued a month ago and it's gotten even more expensive now, then that doesn't prove that we're not in a bubble. It just means that the bubble has continued to grow and when it pops, the resultant crash will be far, far larger. I don't always feel the need to say this, but bubbles always pop. Always. Never in history has a bubble lasted forever. Sometimes they last for years, sometimes even decades, but they always pop and the bubbles we see today are in no way any different. If you're new here, then consider checking out our Patreon. We're building a community of like-minded investors where we can talk and discuss all kinds of ideas, just like we do on this channel. You also gain access to loads of exclusive content that isn't available anywhere else, early access to all videos, private live streams, and buy and sell alerts for my personal portfolio, and you can help support the channel for as little as $1 a month. On top of all that, once we reach 100 patrons, I'm going to hire a full-time video editor to help me put out even more content just like this. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure to subscribe. If you want to help spread the word, then consider liking the video and leaving a comment, and YouTube will do its part by pushing this video out to more people just like you. I really do appreciate all the support you give the channel, even if it's just leaving a like. There's also a link to my other channel down below in the description that you can check out as well. In the description, there's a link to my favorite brokerage called eToro, where you can trade stocks and shares, crypto commodities, foreign currencies, and more, all for 0% commission. There's also a link down below in the description to BlockFi, where you can get up to $250 in free Bitcoin, and you can earn interest on whatever crypto you hold, whether it's Bitcoin, Ether, or stable coins. You can earn as much as 8% interest a year. Thank you all for the support. Thanks for watching. Stay stoic. Until next time.